Yo, Carl, congratulations on hitting 50 episodes, dude. Sorry I'm late to the party, but I hope you keep putting out episodes for a long, long time. In your recent episode, you were asking us what we felt about unboxings and if we thought they were advertisements. I say if it's a game you like, rep it, dude. Like, you're not getting paid. You're not doing anything underhanded. It's just you talking about stuff that you like, man. There, no harm, no foul. I don't see it. And in that first unboxing you did in that episode, I think for City of Pain or something, which is a dope name, uh, that came from Lakewood, Washington, that dude, Joey Turco, that's an amazing name. <laughs> that's just an awesome name. And it's fantastic to learn that there is yet another gaming company in the now undisputed home of RPGs. Washington, peace out. Totally, Joe. Yeah, it's Knights in Pain Town. It's a City of Mist product. And I definitely think you would, I don't know if you like superhero genre, but I think you definitely would like City of Mist at least because it is powered by the apocalypse or a derivation of powered by the apocalypse. And it's really cool. You have the series of like, you know, your playbook has a series of, of definitions of powers you can do. And really the way I feel it works the best when I played is the GM says, hey man, what do you want to do? And you say, I want to do this and this and that. And then we look at your playbook and say, okay, you can apply this and this and that to the roll. You roll your 2d6 and try to get the uh, the big, uh, you know, over over seven, but preferably over nine, right? So, um, and to see what the hell you do with your super duper powers. And I have um, not just the box set, which is a beautiful set and uh I don't know if they have a VTT, but the box set's cool. I got to play um, an NPC named Tlaloc, who is the god of thunder and lightning. Um, Latinx uh, person who can call on the powers of the rain god, which was super cool. I got to blow shit up with my lightning when we played and uh, shoot people with lightning and... Uh, it was really cool. He was also kind of like a street thug or a little street wise and had like side hustles here and there. So had not just, uh, you know, the kind of blow, blow up powers, but powers of persuasion and manipulation at the street, at the street level. So it was cool. I really enjoyed the experience and it'd be great to get together with my buddies and to run some city of mist. And yeah, I think, I wonder if there are, if that company is based or Gamerati it's, it seems like it's based up in Seattle. Um, I guess they distribute these uh, City of, of Mists and other products, which is very cool. So thanks for that, Joe, and reminding me to add that to the list. Carl, Jason, the Rat Pack here. What does the Raiders game offer that Call of Cthulhu doesn't, I wonder? Or Call of Cthulhu plus Pulp Cthulhu by Chaosium doesn't? I mean, obviously... You, you can play an Edwardian setting with Call of Cthulhu. You don't need another game for that. At first, I thought, because you'd made the comment about, you, you know, our unboxings, you know, commercials, I thought maybe you're referring to the infamous list of red, yellow, and green companies. And so maybe, Ry maybe Raiders O'Reilly was from a company you supported more than Chaosium because of their evil political stances. But then you opened a variety of other products from a variety of companies. So I'm not sure that you're on board with the list idea. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure what Ra Raiders offers over Pulp Cthulhu, but I'm interested to hear what you feel it holds. Hey, Jason, that's a great question. Why wouldn't you just use Call of Cthulhu rules for this time period? And I think I bought this book for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it's a self-contained Edwardian age, and you have 1920s Cthulhu and Gaslight Cthulhu, but that period in between, is, I feel, is a little different. This early imperial age, right? Um, and I think the author is also, and it is BRP, so it is totally compatible, right, with Call of Cthulhu, and it's just, to me, more of a world book, though it is self-contained. <clears throat> and there might be a little, there are some differences, right? I guess a tone difference it should be mentioned. And while the Cthulhu mythos involves this pantheon of ancient and powerful deities and is based mainly on Lovecraft, um, it 
doesn't just consist of Lovecraft. And the author specifically mentions Robert Howard. So he's not just combining action and adventure. He's not just having like the Lovecraft works as inspiration, but action and adventure found both in Robert E. Howard, but also Victorian and Edwardian writers like H. Ryder Haggard, Richard Kipling, Arthur Conan Doyle, etc. So, and I think the tone is less nihilism that Lovecraft has throughout his works and more action, adventure, tough, roguish, honor, honor bound uh, heroes that explore exotic settings. And while Cthulhu kind of does that, you have to tack on that idea of the pulp Cthulhu, which sometimes might make it a little cartoony from what I have seen. Um, but um, so definitely, you know, King Solomon's Mines, The Man Who Would Be King, uh, things like that. The Land That Time Forgot, Burroughs is thrown in there too, although not, you know, American, an American writer there, right? So, um, so, so other, other mythos themes, such as the double na age nature of science, Darwinian plasticity of life, time travel, alternate timelines can also be thrown in there. So it's, I guess it's more, it's less solidly Lovecraft and throws in a lot of other ideas and inspiration. And, you know, really, I guess my inspiration also comes from television and watching shows like Downton Abbey. There is de there's definitely a different vibe in Downton Abbey than there is in, say, Victorian era pieces like Ripper Street or Peaky Blinders. Um, or, right, with Ripper Street being set in Victorian and Peaky Blinders being set in post-war, there's something maybe a bit naive in the Edwardian period, but it's still fraught with a danger and secretness, right? This is when all these weird secret societies start forming. Um, as part of the French Belle Epoque, right? A lot of literary and artistic expression that comes after the end of the Victorian era. Um, yeah, you could use Call of Cthulhu, but I guess as a lazy GM sometimes, I like everything self-contained. And that's just the tone, right? The tone is different. So what about mechanics? Are there any, is there anything that they add to their OGL BRP D100 system? that would make it worthwhile in purchasing. I don't know, it's up to you if you if one would want to purchase it anyway. But for me, there's also a more global feel. Um, you know, in the, in the character generation alone, you don't just pick a career like you do in Call of Cthulhu. They really want you to think about your cultural background, where you are from. I mean, there's a quick gazetteer of how different places are, not just uh, Northeast US and England um, are like in the 1920s and, and most Call of Cthulhu things, they really go global. And I think that's pretty cool. They talk about, you know, like, honestly, if I wanted to run a game, I, would, I might use this, this set of rules if I wanted to run a game in, in you know, the world of the Freud Netflix series, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, it seems they talk about you know what's going on in Japan, what's going on in Mexico, uh, what's going on in all over the place, and and it, again it's self-contained as opposed. I mean, you could find that kind of stuff specifically. It's for the 1920s or the Victorian era, and actually the Victorian era, the gaslight stuff is just really um, specific for the for what's going on in the UK. At least, I mean, I guess there's a they now have like the dark. Uh, dark trails, right? Um, down dark trails or whatever for the old west of the U.S., which is contemporary-ish. You know, if you do post, you know, post bellum, um, post Civil War in the U.S., and it's kind of contemporary with the Victorian age. I mean, it, well, it is, I guess, uh, chronologically contemporary, right? Victoria was reigned throughout most of the uh, 19th century. So, yeah, it is. It, I feel like I mean, just looking at it gives a globe a really more of a global feel. Um, that you got to think about your culture, think about you know where you're from, 
They really even go into detail about your family ties and their reputation. So I think on the front end already, it is more, uh, it is a little deeper than Call of Cthulhu. And then finally, you do get to your professional skills. It seem, seemingly you also get special abilities um, here in your particular skills. So similar to Pulp Cthulhu, you have like a talent, but now it's built into your professional ability. So um, it looks like they have, they have a meta currency also, it seems, called Metal Points. Not metal, like Ride the Wings of Lightning Metal, but M-E-T-T-L-E. -T -T -E. So that addition of Metal Points without um, being a pulpy, crazy Cthulhu, uh, pulp Cthulhu crazy hero, they allow for special boosts of heroic effort or courage. You can spend Metal to, for any of the following effects, reroll horror. Oh, nice. Reroll fortitude after reaching zero hit points. Downgrade a critical major wound to a major wound or a major wound to a normal to make the difficulty of a skill roll, including luck or horror, one degree easier. And to take action, extra action during a combat round to raise an advantage one degree or lower an opponent's advantage one degree during combat or to use a special ability. So it seems like they built in this meta currency and you can use it in uh, different ways. So it, it is different, which I think is kind of cool. It seems to give a more, more opportunity for narrative aside from the straight D100 roll. Um, I'll have to look into that lowering and degrees thing. I'll get back to you in a second. Before I get to that, there is something else um, in the character creation called Essential Nature. How would you characterize your adventure as essential nature? And this is kind of how you, it looks like you get improvement points. So the the way that it looks like that you um, improve is less wonky as it is in Call of Cthulhu where you try to roll over. Um, maybe it's a little more complicated, but it looks like you can get actual experience points to add to your skills, um, which is kind of cool. So... You have an essential nature. There's outsider, scoundrel, sleuth, specialist, thrill seeker, socialite, tough. Um, and then you you do things and you receive improvement points. For example, under every man, finding courage under fire, surviving against all odds, etc. And then you can uh, pick professional skills and add add to things, which is kind of neat. It's a little different there. And they they even go into you know how old you are and how that helps or doesn't help you. Um, much like Delta Green, it goes into bonds um, and what helps you remain sane and competent in the world. And so I, I would say it's definitely more granular. That's for some, some people prefer more simple, but I like the, I like the granularity. Um, I think I'm gonna, rolling dice and skill tests, even with regards to skill tests, it is more defined and more granular. They have various levels of skill. So, for example, neophyte and amateur. And at amateur, actually, so if your skill is at amateur level, you automatically get success for general use. So that could prevent, you know, this sort of, we stop the adventure because we can't find the fucking clue, which I always hated. So they're really trying to, to help with that, make it more of a narrative game instead of a, a black and white yes or no, and that granularity helps. There's skill modifiers that can help as well. They give you a guideline for skill modifiers, which is does not exist really. I've probably done that ad hoc, and uh, as a house rule in my Call of Cthulhu games, giving a bonus or not uh, on the skill, but, you know, you, but it's not written into the rules. So I think that's pretty cool too. Again, it seems like there's even more granularity with the mechanics in that. Um, there are some derived statistics, such as action points, uh, for example, that are depend on your um, essence points that depend on some of your attributes. And also, I noticed that skills are linked to certain, some skills are linked to attributes, which is interesting. I have to look to see how that works. Okay, this is pretty cool, too. So there's a list of common skills. And these are linked, they give you a base skill number. They give you a base skill number that is linked to your attributes. So for example, 
your athletics, your base attribute, your base skill for your athletics is your strength plus your deck score, right? So that that's kind of cool. It's it, like I said, it links <clears throat> and links better attributes to skills. Combat also seems <clears throat> more granular. So I guess that's that's what I'm saying. You know, I have to read through the rules and make a decision. I'm not saying I'm going to convert every single Call of Cthulhu game to this system, but it looks like you could use this book in two ways. One, all the Edwardian background is very solid and global, and you could use it for your Call of Cthulhu game just with the Edwardian information alone to plug that gap between Victorian gaslight and Call of Cthulhu uh, standard 1920s. But it also seems like if you want a rule system that is a bit more granular, a bit more updated in its terminology and ideas, especially with regards to mental health. Um, actually, if you're, since you maybe, I don't know if you are, if you are a uh, weapons aficionado, the weapons tables are pretty complex, not complex. Um, I don't even know if complete is the word. Comprehensive is probably the better word. They have all sorts of different weapons that exist around the time, broken down by country. Um, it's a pretty cool table. So it looks like um, they really did their research, want to ground things in realism. Um, Call of Cthulhu can be a little bit, maybe because of the rule set, a little, I don't know, uh, cartoony? Maybe some people treat it a little cartoony. Um Anyway, this one, with the granularity, it can, I guess the idea is to really have a, more of a sense of verisimilitude, um, especially with regards to how your character and the character feels real, um, how they are involved in the world, uh, for both from a family uh, bond and um, network point of view. And uh, the mechanics seem to be able to provide that with a bit of heroism and heroicness in regards, in regards to your special abilities from your profession and these metal points. And uh, combat seems to be, right, a bit not, at, not super, not involved, but I do like the idea of the action point economy um, as opposed, you know, based on your ability as opposed to the weapons traits, um, which I think is cool. And uh, mental health seems a bit more comprehensive as well. I like the idea of degrees of difficulty where you subtract a modifier, add a modifier. Um, that seems a little better than trying to calculate uh, if you get a hard success or an extreme success because um, you do it on the front end. And I do like the idea that degrees of success are important, um, which is kind of cool and helps with opposed roles or with the narrative. Um, they actually go into like a whole section on how to run an investigation and investigative skills and different parameters. If you're doing a quick investigation, how long it takes to case a place, which is something that is definitely missing in Call of Cthulhu. So a lot of it is up to the keeper. So maybe it's just, you know, a, more guides for the keeper to give them a sense, a better sense of the narrative to ground it uh, more realistically. And um, I, I like that. But again, you don't have to use any of the rules that are in here. You can just use the Edwardian background. So there, that's a longer answer than probably you might have anticipated. But uh, Raiders of Rely, I will probably test play it with Amy and see how it goes and then maybe propose it to the group and add it to the list. I'm glad that you're able to maintain that number of games and enjoy them and that that's not negatively impacting you. I, I'm back to the point where I'm in too many games. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see how that pans out. Um, but... No, I've enjoyed the games I played with you. It sounds like you're having a lot of fun in the other games. Sounds like they're all going well. Keep up the great work. That's a good point, Jason. When do we realize that we're 
in too many games. I actually might have to drop a few of the ones that I play in. I don't think I'm, because of kind of how we've done it, I think it's really helpful, it's been helpful to me to run some of the games like every two weeks. Um, for example, Starfinder and Warhammer Fantasy kind of run every uh, every two weeks and they're on opposite weeks so I don't have to scramble to prep. I think that's what drives me crazy sometimes. So it's nice to have like a prep for Tuesday and a prep for Thursday this week with T2K and Warhammer Fantasy and then and then a prep for Saturday for DCC Fantasy. So like every other day prep as opposed to an everyday prep, uh, which if I had a weekly game, that'd be crazy. And then on the opposite weeks, right? It's just prep for Starfinder. And then that opposite week is seems like I play in more games than I prep for, which is kind of cool. So it seems to work out. I might, <clears throat> I might drop uh, some Sunday games just depending, because um, I know Kevin's make, uh, like he wanted to run the Warhammer game as a mini campaign, and you'll see, well, it kind of ended and below. So, um, you know, I might step out and let people play, let someone else participate in this Death Watch game. Uh, we'll see. And, um, and maybe I'll run something there in that afternoon Sunday slot. I know some people who used to play in my Sunday ongoing game a while back want to play some play again so we'll see how that goes but maybe it's just good to take a break and watch some foosball right we'll see fight raven fight we played some etu the other night it was actually pretty fun. Uh, actually, I do have a recording taken from Chubacabracon where uh, a bunch of people um, sing the Ravens fight song from the East Texas University that is portrayed in the ETU Savage Worlds game. So I ran another session, and it was it was actually very interesting because it it was totally it's one of those instances where you play something and you run something, you plan to run a particular, like I was planning to run a particular Savage Tales, and, but I wanted to catch the players up. We had a new player and I wanted to introduce them properly. So I wanted, you know, I, I kind of went through what had happened before in the previous game and what they were gonna do with this artifact that they found. So, uh, and I thought it would go quick, um, but we, uh, we rolled on the table and I rolled for a particular player and uh, they, because they weren't there, so they're, I'm treating them as an NPC. So they had some suspicion. They had some suspicion that this artifact was cursed for three weeks. They've been experiencing strange occurrences, uh, migraine one week, being followed by mice another week, causing commotion, of course, in the uh, cafeteria, and then having scratches or knocks on the door with no one being there. So it was very concerning to this person, and they went to talk about it to their mentor, who the person who had offered to be their mentor, Professor McClanahan. And when he, he kind of asked, and the player felt a bit that he, he was too eager, and it was a little suspicious. So she went back to the conclave, the group of, of other students who had been part of the last uh, two adventures into the weird here at ETU and uh, they said yeah let's let's think about this let's not really turn it in but of course this pl uh, person wants to get rid of it um, because it's ruining her life with this curse so um, they talk about it and they discuss it and I don't remember who but it was probably uh, Jason's character Jason plays uh, Daniel D. Day Lewis who is a, a person going to school on the GI Bill a little older maybe 26 or so um, compared to the rest of the of the other students, um, he's a business major and is part of a fraternity. Um, so uh, using sort of the, a modified frat boy archetype. So and his uh, son was playing as well, and his son decided to play the active an activist um, named Ash Zero. Gar I don't know if it was Garvey. I don't know if it was. I think it was. 
I think the last name was similar to the character in Evil Dead, if I recall correctly, but Ash uh, Zero, which is a medic name, rolled an activist archetype who we decided was the roommate of the of the person who had this uh, cursed uh, artifact. Sorry, ar activist archetype. So anyway, so they decide among both of them, among them, um, well, let's take it to a museum. How can we get it to back Mexico? And then someone said, why don't we take it to like a Mexican consulate? And uh, I was like, oh, wow, this is going to be really fun. So I just Google it. Well, I knew already that there's a Mexican consulate in Houston, Texas, and East Texas University is in some Pine Box, Texas in the fiction, which is some town in East Texas uh, between Nacogdoches and Beaumont, um, similar to where Stephen F. Austin would be or Lamar University. Um, I think there is actually, there's a Blinn, is it Blinn College is in Huntsville? No, Sam Houston State is in Huntsville. Um, I think Blinn is there too. There are number, numerous small universities in East Texas that are not the big one, Texas A&M, or the bigger, b the big, big one. Well, they're both big, big ones. Texas A&M actually has better, much better football team the last few years because they're in the SEC, which is the best conference in college football. Fight me. Um, and there's also Texas, uh, Texas, University of Texas in Austin, uh, which is like Longhorns and stuff. Anyway, so there is a Mexican consulate in Houston, and I I love doing this because it's like we're playing in the real world. Uh, so I can use Google Maps, and we just kind of I just spontaneously come up with okay, so I guess we're going on a road trip, and uh, Jason's character D Day has a um, a car he decided it was a dodge charger he has the uh edge where his he's rich so he can get a car uh, according to the uh the rules so he has a dodge charger they all pile into the car um the conclave that's what uh, uh one of the the player npc player who has this mexican artifact decided to call this group i said they can change it whenever they want but she calls it the conclave just because um and they start driving down to houston down us uh, 59 they decide to go back roads as opposed to uh, I-45, which is a high interstate highway between uh, Houston and Dallas. And the route, according to Google Maps, was US 59, and then hit I-69 uh, in route from you know to it directly into Houston. So I think 69 is somewhere around Livingston, is a big lake, Livingston Lake, man-made lake, I think. Anyway, so they're driving. Uh, uh, D-Day notices they're being pursued. And they um, they pull off, and then yes, there is a Walmart. I looked it up. That's again. This is why this game was so fun to me because I could use like real world stuff um, for the game. And they pull into a Walmart parking lot. They drive around uh, the the car that's following them. It's like a you know one of those typical government uh, tinted window SUV type. Uh, Ash takes a picture of the uh, license plate and. Um, notices that it is a government issue but can't figure out the uh they can't figure out the agency it's kind of obscure uh maybe or i don't know maybe it doesn't exist anyway um they they lose them we do a little chase a mechanic thing a chase scene um i think savage world is a pretty cool chase mechanic and and jason rolled really well for d days driving and got out of there very relatively quickly you know a couple rounds of chase and um escaped fled got back onto the highway decided to take even more back roads which we found out on google um and uh, eventually they got to the mexican consulate in houston there uh they went to the parking lot across the street and they saw another one of these suvs before it saw them so uh d-day drives in front of the mexican consulate the other uh People get out, so it's Ash, Thelma, and Jack get out and run into the consulate while uh, D-Day drives up to a guy wearing a blue suit that Ash notices is from a uh, place called the Sweetheart Foundation, which is a bio, uh, biological and pharmaceutical company, research and pharmaceutical company, and uh, D-Day drives up to him, rolls down the window and says, hey man, what's up? Need a ride? And uh, then takes a picture of him and drives off before the guy can even react. They totally surprise the guy. So Jason leads the these people in this unmarked, in these uh, unmarked vehicles 
or government issue plate vehicles on a chase through the streets of Houston. And it's really cool because I looked up where the Mexican consulate was. It is slightly northeast of the zoo, the Natural Museum of History, Rice University, and MD Anderson Medical Center. So uh, Jason loses these, the pursuit, his character loses the pursuit, make, uh, par parks in one of the hospital parking lots and goes and rents a vehicle. And there are a lot of rental places actually around Rice and, and MD Anderson for sure. Um, so he gets a minivan and then goes to camp out at a turkey. And this has become the really fun, <laughs> interesting thing. I noticed that on the Google map, there's a turkey leg hut uh, about seven blocks from the consulate. So Jason decides to go there. He freaks out when he sees some men in blue suits eating there and enjoying their turkey legs. It goes back to the rental place, gets a new minivan, and decides to park it at the zoo. Um, that's his little adventure. Meanwhile, in the consulate, uh, the players are are taken. Uh, I think uh, Ash persuaded, and had they had taken done the proper procedures. Ash is a pre-law major, went through the proper protocol and procedures, effectively to get, you know, an interview or uh, an appointment with the consulate. Um, they, they are impressed by these students. They let them in, and uh, they meet the director of antiquities, who her name is Maria de la Garza, um, and uh, she hits it off with them. They give the artifact back. She gives them her card, and I think we stopped there, uh, mainly because one of the players was not there, Arlen Walker of Live from Pelham's Wasteland, and he's an archaeology major, so this might be a cool opportunity for some role-playing and networking, and I don't want him to lose out. We decided to stop there. Uh, the cool thing, too, is I told my wife about the game, and she kind of wants to join now. She's probably going to be play the sorority girl archetype, and she already has developed a backstory and how she could meet the players at the consulate. So that, I think, is very cool, too. Um, anyway, that is ETU, a fun, uh, freaking fun game, and I love that it was just totally spontaneous, a lot of cat and mouse and evasion, uh, no fights. Um, the man in the blue suit did have a taser, but, uh, you know, no one can outrun a Dodge Charger, right? Okay, ETU. So we should play again in two weeks. We'll see how this goes. The second game I played this weekend is a game of Astonishing Swordsmen and Sorcerers of Hyperborea run by Kevin Madison. In that game, I play Iphigenia, an Amazonian warlock, so a warrior spellcaster who is specialized in the necromantic art. So I guess I started in Medius Rest because I missed the last session and I'm fighting this freaking demonic, demonic uh, crocodile creature with multiple mouths on its arms. It's really weird. It's a tough fight. The other two uh, people who were there, other players who, sh who showed up, their characters were down and out and uh, dying. I think one of them might've been dying. I'm not sure. <laughs> Are bleeding out. So fortunately, I have some luck. Uh, Iphigenia is a good warrior. She cuts down this creature, takes some damage um, from it, almost gets chomped up, and we're down pretty badly beat up. Um, we're in this like a uh, chamber full of eggs of toads, uh, toad creatures that are being corrupted. Anyway, we cut down this creature. We stabilize. I stabilize um, one of the player characters uh, characters and then we just need to rest for a little bit I keep watch while they rest and then I when one of them is able to heal some I rest myself and get some healing but we're pretty beat up um, we keep exploring it seems like uh, the last time they had not cleared the place out but driven a lot of the bad guys out of the temple and it was very quiet no more croaking uh, we keep exploring, and eventually we come to this um, shrine or sanctuary. Uh, I guess maybe we're a little greedy. We see two um, large crocodile men in prayer. We take them out very quickly, and then we keep going. We find this large cistern or pool with full of brackish water, and this god thing comes out. It is a massive crocodile the size of a blimp gargantuan some 40 feet maybe more uh, um in length uh it part we i don't know if we really parlay but it taunts us like it's going to eat us uh it is very interested in one of the player characters who is a a zeke from 17th century earth who, who many 
monsters and adversaries have called the Traveler um, because of where he's come from and how he's in this Hyperborea world. But anyway, uh, we start fighting. We think we can kite it. Uh, we It summons some um, other of those creatures that I fought before but not fully formed. We take those out and, uh, and then we try to kite it back uh, through the temple and it it doesn't work quite well. The creature gets to um, Amar, the 17th century Zeke monk, and bites him and tosses him aside. Fortunately, another, and I'm like, I had drunk in a potion of flying, and I'm flying back, firing, fly, firing, fly. Um, I guess I probably misjudged a little bit and maybe should have moved and then fought, fired at one point, but uh, the creature catches up. It charges me down while I'm flying in the air because it's flying too. Um, and it bites me and I kind of float down to the floor. Um, that was actually, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that, I mean, I don't know how I would have ruled that in the moment, but I appreciate uh, Kevin Madison of Dungeon Musings a Media Empire uh, letting me float down gently to the ground. Um, I guess as my potion expires, uh, maybe that's what happens. You just float to the ground. Anyway, um, fortunately, uh, Amar is stabilized by the other player character who's playing an Inuit uh, ice mage, and he runs, and he runs through the temple enough to evade this giant god creature, god crocodile, and he drags, he finds my uh, character's body, drags her out, and we get to the under the under part of the temple uh, the cre- while well, the creature is close on our heels. Like, we have to wait for an elevator for a while, just like in, in a movie. It's pretty harrowing. But we survive. Um, we'll see what happens. I I don't know. I My character can't really... I'm trying to be good and not give any ideas uh, while I'm unconscious. Um, so we'll see if that works out, because I feel like we should lay low and hide um, in the under temple and try to recover instead of trying to fight our way out from underneath the temple. Um, but we'll see how it goes. I'm unconscious and my player character will have to rely on the savvy of this Inuit Ice Mage. Well, we play in two weeks and we'll see if we survive. This is a more difficult recap to record because we lost. I don't like to lose. I'm pretty competitive. Um, But, you know, sometimes the dice, ultimately what it is, is that sometimes the dice don't work in your favor. This is my Warhammer second edition game that I play, that is, I played a dwarf um, named Gorilla Blacktooth, who's a gambler. It is run by Kevin Madison of the Dungeon Musings Media Empire. And uh, we, well, how did we lose? Well, um, it's hard to, I mean, ultimately, like, like I said, it's because of the die rolls, but tactically, uh, we could have been better. Something that Kevin does, and we all know it, is that if your player doesn't show up, then your character is not there. There is no explanation. They're just not there, and you cannot use those resources. And that's what happened. Maybe that's what happened in, in the Ash game also. Uh, there were only three of us out of a possible of like six or seven players. And I mean, as a player, you want to continue, you want to push the story, but maybe I guess if we're lesson learned, if we are um, down a player or two, then use more caution. But then that delays, honestly, the completion of the task. And in this case, there was actually a, if we had delayed, there was a consequence, right? We're on a timeline, we learned later. Um, something was going to happen. It was going to continue to happen, especially because of things that we did. So the last time we had assaulted this uh, bastion of a cult of a ruinous power, my, our characters did not know, but I know it was Nurgle. It was disease and rot down there. Um, we found, uh, we opened and found this shrine, and, and the shrine was a foul-looking altar with dead bodies and maggots and that. So uh, we burned it. Uh, my character and another character just 
we got sick doing this. Um, my character got even more sick, so I, I had the bloody flux, and I had contracted the green pox, which is really, I mean, when we looked at the rules, I mean, disease in Warhammer Fantasy 2nd Edition is pretty damn bad. I haven't looked to see the rules in 4th Edition, um, and it looks like you'd have to use a lot of, uh, if you played it by the numbers, you'd have to hope you'd have to use a lot of fate and fortune to survive. Um, so that is something that would have had to happen had my character continued. Maybe not for the bloody flux, because I was temporarily and not terminal, but the green pox definitely would have likely had to use a fate point permanently to stave off death. And then, and the consequences of the green pox too is that if you fail your toughness at the end, even if you do survive, you'll be permanently scarred as if you had you know, chicken pox scars and measles um, so, or measles scars, right? So it's pretty bad. It's like the green measles effectively. So anyway, my character was messed up and sick. I mean, and you know, mechanically minus 15 uh, to everything, to every single stat, which is, includes fighting, uh, toughness. Um, he was pretty messed up. Um, after we burned that crypt up, um, we uh, we opened this other door and this Barrow White uh, came out. I guess it had been captured by the cultists and we kind of fled. We did a fighting bat retreat back and we fled. Um, it really wasn't our enemy. It was a, a foul, deadly thing, but uh, not a part of the ruinous power. So we went back to find the, uh, um, the thieves in the woods who had been displaced by Lord Angeron. Um, we found some. They took us back to their new camp because they had been displaced and were being attacked and harassed by the Lord. We presented our findings to their leader, the Faceless. And uh, yeah, he was uh, he was supportive, but it's like, okay, well, you guys are going to have to do it. I don't want my men to be involved. Maybe we should have pressed the point because we definitely needed it. And we went to go ambush Lord Angeron. Apparently he went to the chapel every night to uh, quote unquote pray, but we we felt that he was probably perverting the temple at, at best. Um, so we we saw him go in at night. We followed him in and we started to fight. And I guess since my character was dying, I just rushed at him hopefully to delay enough that the players could destroy the book or help, or help take him out. Um, and uh, it didn't work. So I, I guess I lasted a few rounds. One player went to go burn the book, but uh, was um, scared off by being attacked by maggots as the book was protecting himself. It did start to burn, but it probably wasn't enough. Um, and, uh, and then he came to fight with me, which probably wasn't helpful because he was really down a lot of health. Um, I lasted a few rounds. I got hit, like, I think I took three, maybe four hits from the great sword of this guy, and we were, had sling support. But then after the sling, after I fell and the other player character fell, um, the halfling who was tossing sling stones that was actually damaging the guy hit him twice in the arm and once in the head. Didn't kill him, but was whittling him down. Uh, he fled, and uh, Lord Andron completed his ritual because um, he didn't. Why? Why pursue? And uh, perverted the Grail Temple, became a, a chaos warrior, uh, you know, demon thing. And uh, yeah, we lost two characters dead. And one character fled, but uh, the ruinous powers win. So I'm debating whether I'm going to continue. You can use fate uh, and burn fate permanently to somehow miraculously survive. I took a critical hit to the shoulder, which nearly severed the arm, but did, we realized did not. Just bled him out, so somehow he would have survived. The other character got hit in the face. So you know how that massive scar, how that would work, I don't know. But uh, I'm, I, like I said, I'm debating whether I might just make another character. Uh, we were definitely, we definitely need a more martial character. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I know if you roll up a character in Warhammer Fantasy II, it's random for the most part, unless you're given dispensation by the GM. Um, so the chances of making a warrior type are very slim. It was very slim that I actually rolled up a dwarf, right? So... Um, I don't know, or maybe I can try to 
move into a more martial career, but we definitely need armor and someone who can fight a little better and not someone who has the bloody flux and the green pox, uh, which makes them half as effective, right? So, I mean, and it was a little frustrating. I try to bite my tongue um, during play and I'm not going to give the specifics of my frustration suffice it to say and chalk it up to bad rolls because my character I mean granted sick sick and debilitated as he was was not connecting and the last time when he was it turned out he was a fierce warrior hacking cultists left and right but that was before he had those minuses and the dice just weren't with us so that's ultimately what happened so there you go we lost in Warhammer Fantasy 2nd Edition. I think it was called Ill Tidings, the adventure. So, uh, yeah, it's a tough adventure uh, for novice characters. All right. Hey, everyone. I wanted to talk a little bit about what happens when players aren't there. What do you do? I've described what Kevin Madison does. You know, if you're not there, your player is not there, you cannot use your resources. And he does admonish us when we try to pretend that the player might be there. I mean, I played with him a long time, so I realize that I don't get admonished so much. You just kind of got to roll with it. And like I mentioned earlier, you want to continue to play the adventure. And maybe we should be more cautious if we have the time to be more cautious about it. Because both games this weekend players weren't there, we were shorthanded, but we pushed forward anyway to fight a dangerous foe, and it just uh, it didn't work, right? Um, in, in Ash and Reavers of Tule, my character was taken down, um, fortunately survived, because it got knocked down to negative three. At negative four in Ash, you start bleeding out, and uh, at net from zero to negative three, you are unconscious but stable. I kind of like that idea, um, so um, and it benefited us. Another character was taken to negative four, but one player did have enough time and room and whatever to stabilize them before that character fled and grabbed my character and dragged them, dragged them out of the temple, while the god, the god thing was um, pursuing. So it worked out that we didn't get TPK'd, but uh, definitely. In the Warhammer game, uh, while it wasn't a complete TPK, it was a total loss. And had other players been there, we might have succeeded or had a hot better chance of succeeding. But that's just not the way Kevin runs his game. In my games, I don't mind if we use players who aren't there as NPCs. I definitely ask the player if we can use them as an NPC. Some players say, yeah, that's no problem. Other players prefer not to. And that's cool too. So and that in that category, then you might end up in a similar situation that uh, me as a player and other the other players of mine, our players who are playing with me in these games ended up shorthanded in a tough situation. And I guess then you would be more cautious, right? <clears throat> so the question I have for you all is as a GM um, and as a player, what do you prefer? Do you prefer, you know, the questions are, if you're a GM, do you allow players who aren't there, do you allow their characters to be used if they give permission? And second, if you're a player, do you care if your character is used, you know, when you're not there? And preferably you would give permission. I would never want to not let that happen. I mean, then again, there are also situations where, um, let's say a player plays like one time and doesn't come back. Right or plays a couple of times and says and pieces out, so um, I guess that's a sub question. What do you do with their characters, especially if they've been integral to the story? That is a hard thing to figure out. Right, um, for me, a big thing is breaking verisimilitude in the games. Right, they're not real, but I want them to be logical, um, and that's why I prefer if a player is not there and they've given permission that their players could be used. Sometimes it's not necessary, but it's nice to have that option, in my opinion.
But now for another uplifting message from Joe Richter of Hindsightless. Yo, Carl, that Lankmar DCC tournament game you got sounds awesome. I think you should run it as a tournament. Forget fantasy football, which is just RPGs for dudes that don't play RPGs. No, just kidding. I know plenty of people that do both. I just like saying that to people that do fantasy football but rip on role-playing games. Anyway, man, it sounds like that tournament you're supposed to do like party versus party versus party. So you could do like a $20 entry fee per party. Um, you could either do winner takes all or winner takes most second place gets some third gets their money back. I don't know. You'd need a lot of players to do it, but you play games with a lot of people. It might be fun. Think about it. Peace out. Hey Joe, that sounds like a dope idea to use your Northwestern U S slang. It would be fun even at the basic level and maybe not a full tournament, but live action players versus you know vtt players and see who how they do and who does it um there's an upcoming convention that the wolf clan is putting on so maybe i could introduce it there i'd have to read up and see i don't know if i'd want to take money and give away prizes i think it would just be for bragging rights really and um or money would be donated to charity like all you celebrities who sign up for this can play and whoever wins gets the entry fee to donate the collection of the entry fees to donate to the charity of their choice. That would be something I'd be more for, but that's a really great idea. Joe Richter. Um, yeah, we'll see. It'd be fun to play this in any case, whether in a, in a tournament style or not. And I'm looking forward to continuing to play in DCC. And I definitely want to give DCC Lankmar a go. So um, thanks for the call in, man. And I think uh, there's been a lot to talk about and to discuss in this um, podcast. So I think I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks, Joe, for the call.